we are going to spend this first hour focusing on ways to source, sort, store, and transport books. Everybody here on this forum, we have all different ways that we source our books, whether people are doing book drives, they're doing the Dolly Parton Imagination Library, purchasing at indie bookstores. So to get everything started, if everybody can just jump into the chat and list the ways that you source your books. Um, we started just a real quick list, but my goal is that this can be used as a reference throughout the year if you need new ways, new ideas of how to source more books. Okay, we've got a little bit starting. Because the majority of us do book drives uh, and uh, some of the, the, whether we're purchasing from Barnes and Noble, I wanted to really focus on three specific ways that people are sourcing large quantities of books. We're gonna be talking with um, Ryan Jackson from Open Book about using outdoor bins. And then we'll talk to Larry Abrams from Book Smiles about Goodwill, Salvation Army, and Better World books. Uh, but if we can get Ryan to jump on. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Okay. I, oh, there we go. All right. Awesome. Good morning, Ryan. Good morning, everyone. So, Ryan. If you just want to give a real quick info about open books, and then we're going to jump in. He has four metal bins placed across Chicago. Yeah, so open books is a 501c3 that provides literacy programs and book granting. Uh, we also have a earned income model where we run three stores as well as an e-commerce business for the books. We collect all books, not just kids books. So like the kids books get a lot, a lot given away. The adult stuff gets sold in various ways to help, you know, supplement the philanthropic dollars uh, that we receive. Perfect. And so just looking at the the metal bins, the four that you place around, where did you purchase those bins from? <laughs> it's a it sounds like a fake website. It's called recyclingbin.com. Um, there's a huge they're they are a manufacturer in New Jersey. It takes them about a month to put them together for you uh, for cost, which I think is the next question. They cost about $1,500 or it's about $2,000. They're the big ones that you see. They're about seven feet tall, four by four uh, footprint. Uh, so about $2,000 for the bin, $500 for shipping from New Jersey to Chicago. Uh, and then, then we wrap them because uh, you need to. Uh, that, that costs about $800 to do a full four-sided wrap. So you're basically, if you're gonna buy one, you're about 3K landed all in. Okay, and Kelly, do you mind just dropping in and sharing the screen so that way we can see pictures of what open book bins look like? Uh, Ryan, how many books do those bins hold? They hold about a Gaylord's worth of books. Um, so depending on what type of books, I said we take everything that's anywhere from 1,000 to 1,500. I mean, it's smaller kids' books, larger adult books. Um, so it's about, but it's about a Gaylord's total. Okay, and just looking at the picture, the the wrapping looks fantastic, but I also see on the right hand side all those books piling out. Uh, how do you handle the pickup of those books? So we have vans running th throughout the city every day doing pickups from individual donors, and so that's part of their route is picking those up. You can kind of see on that picture on the right on the side those black totes that are there, plastic totes that are there. You can buy it on Depot or Costco. So the drive, one of our drivers picks those up and puts them into those black totes and then into our van and then back to our warehouse. Okay. And about how long does it take to empty one of those bins? It takes between 45 minutes and an hour, depending on, that one looks more like an hour, um, depending on how much of a mess it is coming in. We also sometimes put the um, plastic bins from the post office uh, in the bottom of it. That's not on that one, unfortunately. Uh, to help remove the sort of bottom edge of it and keep it a little bit more stable because um, it, it raises the, the sort of floor of it all um, so it won't fall out quite as much as that that picture does. Okay, I know at Book Fairies, we also have one of these bins. Uh, what we've been able to do is get a, a giant tub or toter that's on wheels 
And so we put that in, that's able to contain the majority of the books. And then the one that we have is local to us. So we could just push it into the warehouse, but it's a little easier to, to pull out from there. Um, you know, my, one of my wish list items would be to get a box truck with a lift gate so then you could do exactly what Amy's talking about off site, off site and then just throw it into the back of the truck, which wish, wish list item for me. Yeah, I think we all have very long wish list items for each of our nonprofits. Um, so going back, how did you figure out the best places to place these bins? Um, it's a little bit trial and error. It's, a lot of it is getting a good partner where you know that it can be accessible, that people will be able to, like the one on the left there, um, that's in a parking lot of a mall. So it's easy for people to pull up a car to. Uh, it's a mall, so a lot of people go to it. They know where it is. The one on the the one in the middle on the right are at a school um, uh, in a very wealthy part of Chicago, so we get very great kids books out of that. So it's sort of targeting partners where we think we'll get the best return and make it easiest for the donor. Do you pay any rent to place these bins in? We do not. Uh, you can pay rent to steal the clothing bins everywhere and Planet Fitness and that. Those are mostly paying rent. We've to keep costs down have just like recruited partners who like our mission, like what we do and are willing to help out. Um, yeah, I know that we had talked earlier, but you had reached out to the Chamber of Commerce and some of the city council members. Uh, can yeah. you just tell us a little bit about those yeah, ideas? The, the one that you're looking at in the, in the center and the right there are, is that a school, um, that school partnership was brokered at starting with the city, the city councilmen, the aldermen, what we call them here in Chicago, the alderman and the chamber of commerce of that area. And then they approached the school and made the connection for us. The school was excited to do it, but they, they were essential in getting that sort of first step in. And then they also, in at least in Chicago, aldermen have a very good reach in terms of their newsletter. So it's a, it's a really good marketing thing. They, they feel good about themselves and pat themselves on the back for giving to a local nonprofit and helping out a local nonprofit. But just that line in the newsletter alerts a ton of the neighborhood people that the bin is there and that they can donate to. And just looking at some of the questions, what are some of the pain points that you've had in dealing with the bins? I mean, the pain point right there is that it's phys it's, phys it's a lot of physical work. It's tough. It's tough on the staff. Um, that boxing all that stuff up and that bins crouched over, putting it in the van is, is, is tough for people. Um, also a pain point is filling up too fast which is a good problem to have but then you gotta you're oh, and people put things outside of the bin sometimes they don't realize that there's a slot there which is seems silly but they don't uh and then you kind of threaten your relationship with your partner if books are outside the bin and it's looking like a mess and then it rains and then everyone gets upset and so it's like you gotta be kind of on top of these um and they do takes they take time to get to and because we have one of them in the suburbs are spread out throughout the city. Um, so it takes, there, there's a time commitment there in order to like maintain the relationship and not ruin any books. You just have to be on top of it and being you know, flexible around them. Okay. Uh, and if anybody has any other questions, definitely pop them in as we're talking. We're just going to talk for a minute or two more. And did you need any kind of special insurance to place these bins? No, it's, it's covered under my uh, general liability insurance. Uh, you have a COI for each spot, but they're, um, they're, it's just covered under general uh, liability. Okay. And what, what is the percentage of books that you usually find are available that people that you actually use in program? Well, so, I mean, because we have this model where we use, we try to use every book. We do not use every book. We try to use every book as we can, as best we can. I, I, it depends on each location, um, better or worse. The one in the suburbs tends to get more, is, is probably a, a lower percentage, it's probably around 25 to 30%. The one that you looked at at the school is a much higher percentage, it's probably around 60 to 70%. And then we've got, and then a couple other ones are just very in between. One of the really good things for about them, about, about percentages, is that when you make it convenient for people to donate, they donate frequently. And so, you're less reliant on people building up a huge few boxes over the years and then 
the books are older and, they, and they're not as appealing to kids and they're not things. If you give people like the ability to donate quickly when they're done with something, that you tend to get a higher quality, newer books out of that thing. And so that, that's the sort of strategic part about where to put the bins to make that as convenient as possible. And what I thought was interesting that, that you had said earlier is when you first place a bin, there's almost a deluge of books that come in. Everybody is excited. Everybody clears off their bookshelves. So if people are going to use this route of placing binge, just know that what for the first month or two, three months, that don't judge that as to what your regular pickup schedule is going to be. Um, but the benefit also is that those large donations will will stop happening. Uh, let me rephrase that. It's more those the the good quality of books are going to start coming in after because people who are clearing out their attics and garages, they're just going to contact you directly and not put them into the bin. Okay, um, Ryan, do you mind just adding your chat sure. and your contact information into the chat? Sure. And if you have any other additional questions for Ryan, feel free to reach out. I think we were going to drop in where 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 you can post those we do that's already in the chat where you can purchase the recycling bins and thank you ryan we're gonna jump over to larry at book smiles and i just want to start and talking about the relationship that you have with good War, goodwill and <laughs> world books as more of a way to harness a large donation coming in um can you tell us about the relationship you have with goodwill Absolutely. Uh, one important thing to know is that we now have space. Uh, just five months ago, we did not have space. We were working out of 1,000 square feet. It was really cramped. Once we moved to the 4,300 square feet, which is where we are now, I developed a relationship with our local Goodwill of South Jersey. Basically, I knew someone who knew the president and CEO of Goodwill Philadelphia South Jersey. And uh, he is absolutely open to giving us four pallets, uh, four Gaylords of books each month. I have a box truck, so I'm able to go and pick those books up, but it's quality stuff. Very little is thrown away. They deliberately set aside children's books for us and they do us that favor. So we're in. So when you were first looking at starting with Goodwill, did you try individual stores first? I did not. Uh, I would go and I would want to talk to the manager and I always got blown off. Uh, I wasn't making any any good headway, but then I joined a, you know a, a kind of do-gooder organization, the Kiwanis. And by networking in those organizations, one Kiwanian knew someone who was serving on the board of Goodwill South Jersey, Philadelphia, and that's how I was able to get in. Uh, and I think that that's pretty common in a lot of places that you have to go to that higher level. And once they say, yes, we're going to go ahead with this partnership, then the rest of the stores fall into place. And I, my guess is this model would work across the U.S., also in the Salvation Army stores as well. Yeah, we don't have a Salvation Army uh, near us, but I, I really do think that uh, if our counterparts around the country went to their goodwill. Uh, you can use me as an example of you know, Goodwill Philadelphia, South Jersey. There are about 20 collection sites all across the region and they develop, you know, they get so many books and we're only taking a fraction. I see huge potential here nationally. I agree, I agree. Did you sign any type of contract or have to provide any advertising or anything in exchange for receiving the books from Goodwill? No, in fact, they don't want to publicize it for whatever reason, and I respect that. So we just keep it on the DL. And uh, there are no contracts, no bill of lading. Every month I go there and I pick up four full pallets of books and uh, four Gaylords, and there are about 1,800 books in each Gaylord. And I'm able to use about, for Goodwill, about 90% of what they give us, I can actually use to give to our kids. And it's all children's. Okay, that's really high. And 
how much can you specify the age range that you're looking for? All over the board. A uh, huge number of baby board books, quality baby board books in these goodwill um, in these goodwill things. And they like giving to us because they admitted to me that these would have gotten sold for pulp, you know, for some nominal amount, and they prefer giving to us. So they're they're really good partners. That's fantastic. I but know you have to pick up the books. They will not bring them to you. And just to go over, Larry has a box truck with the lift gate and the pallet jack. So you are able to handle a much larger quantity, uh, whereas a number, the majority of us, we don't have that that truck type capacity. But uh, you could rent one. Sorry to cut you off. You can rent them at, uh, you know, uh, Penske, Goodwill, uh, not Goodwill, but um, U-Haul will also uh, rent you a box truck for the day. And a buck fifty to rent a box truck for a day with a lift gate is well worth it. You just need to figure out how to use the lift gate, and it's not, not hard. You can learn how to do it on YouTube. <laughs> Perfect. Like uh, any any pain points we should be aware of just with going through Goodwill? No, not at all. No, it's it's a great experience. Okay, that was yeah. easy enough. So hopefully, some of us are going to start looking into Goodwill. Uh, and then just to switch to Better World Books, and I don't think a lot of us know that you can reach out to Better World to have them create shipments of books for you. Can you just tell us a little bit about how you reached out to them and and the types of pallets that you've received? Okay, sure. Uh, it wasn't. It was actually Mark from uh, Maryland Book Bank uh, gave me this lead, and I know you're out there, Mark. Thank you so much. Uh, again, getting to a bigger book bank with more space. I needed to get more product in and Better World Books has been uh, really good. Uh, we've imported one full truckload from them. That's 24 Gaylords. Uh, they are they charge me $360 for the pallets and for the Gaylords, but the books are free. And I also have to uh, come up with about 1100 bucks to uh, pay to have them professionally imported. So we're looking at about $1,500 for 24 Gaylords of books, you know, that's 32,000 books. A lot of Better World books, I warn you though, a lot of it is uh, their library books. They're in generally good shape. They come, you know, I, I can use maybe one quarter of what Better World gives me, uh, but many of them are just quality library books that look great maybe in a book arc or a little free library but they're not the standards that we really want to give to our kids. We want to give our children books that look like new. Uh, and when you did that request from Better World Books, were you able to say what categories or age ranges? No, no, no. They, you know, they're, they're doing uh, above and beyond, uh, just diverting the children's books into Gaylords. That is an extra step for them. It probably cost them a little extra money to do that, to separate those children's books. But uh, they are doing the right thing, and their, uh, you know, people in good faith are donating these books. They're for profit, but they are super helpful with um, providing to. Uh, I know at least uh, Mark's place in mind. So um, I had actually just reached out and just heard back from Better World Books. So I just wanted to share a little bit of information with you guys. And that is, they do not have a limit on the number of books that you can request from Better World Books. So if you are requesting a smaller amount, they just put them into boxes and that can be shipped out to you at your cost for shipping. Um, or they can go a full truck, which will be up to anywhere from 24 to 48 Gaylords. Um, the other thing that I thought was really interesting from them, they you can specifically request Spanish books, French books, books by biopic authors or characters, holiday books, which, you know, that's whether whether you would need the holiday books. And um, in there, the organizations, they are shipping from Indiana, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Scotland. So that one may be a little bit more pricey for you. Uh, they will be able to sort them into pre-K, K through fourth, fifth through eighth, and then young adult. Um, 
Larry, are there any other, oh, it looks like Dana from Promising Pages just had a great experience. Any other pain points that you've experienced with Better World that we should be aware of or look out for? I think timing was one of those. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of on their schedule. That's exactly right. We uh, we have been needing a, a shipment from Better World Books now for almost two and a half weeks, and they promised that they're on it. But again, I have to work at their convenience. They have to wait, make sure that it gets weighed. So, uh, oh God, my my fear is that they will one day start charging. I mean, that's I'm just thinking about that in the back of my mind where they start charging. $50 per um, Gaylord. I hope they don't, but I'm prepared to do that, pay that if they are going to begin charging. Okay, great. Um, Larry, thank you so much. We are going to drop in, uh, Larry, if you could put in your, your contact information, um, but we are going to drop in the contact information for Better World Books in case anybody wants to reach out to them and learn a little bit more. And now we are going to move on to Colleen Watt, who is the Operations Director at Cleveland Kids Book Bank. And she's going to give us a tour of her warehouse and show us how her books are processed. So you are probably going to have a ton of questions. I know I've done this tour with her twice, and each time it's been anywhere from one to two hours because of the questions that I had. But my hope is that as Colleen walks us through, we just, this is one way that we can see to sort books. And um, anyone who has different ways, please drop them in the chat. This is really just a full sharing of information. Um, okay, Colleen. So can you just take us from the very beginning when a book comes in and is donated to Cleveland Kids Book Bank and just show us that step? Sure. So I'm here in the warehouse. I'm going to flip my camera around. Okay, so this is our entrance. Um, when we get a, a book donation that comes in on the other side of this store, um, if they're being delivered to us in, you know, plastic bins that the donor would like to keep, um, we will roll this big canvas bin out to their car, dump their books gently into the canvas bin, and then roll the bin into our warehouse. Um, if they're being dropped off in boxes that the donor does not have any interest in keeping, uh, we'll put them on a flatbed cart, flatbed cart like this, roll the cart out to the book donation and put the boxes on the cart like this. Um, and then once those books have been brought into the warehouse, they will be transported over here. We have a group this morning from all the way from Howard University on their alternative spring break. Um, so we are bustling. They will come all the way down this uh, row of Gaylords here. Well, they'll be put into any of the Gaylords that are looking a little bit low. Um, and then they'll be sorted by reading level straight from these Gaylords. Okay, and once they go into the Gaylords, have you found any of the books are damaged or folded or bent once they're put in there? You know, really similar to what Ryan was saying about the books that are put into the outdoor collection bins, truly not. Uh, there are a handful. I would say it's a really small percentage, less than 5%, um, probably even less than 3% of the books that come to us that are put in Gaylords get crunched. They lay pretty nicely on top of each other. Okay. And once they're in the Gaylords, what is the next step? So once they're in the Gaylords, um, let me turn my camera around again. Once they're in the Gaylords, they get sorted by reading level by groups of volunteers like these guys. Uh, these canvas bins against the wall, which we did purchase, um, they cost $200 a piece when we bought them. So it was a really big investment. Um, and I have since looked and they've gone up by like $100. Um, unfortunately. So we, we have these bins labeled by their reading level. Sorry. And uh, we have little examples above the bins, like for our picture book bin, we've got examples of what might be in there. Um, we have board books all the way through teen, young adult. And then we also really encourage everybody to be critical about books that are not in good condition. 
Um, and that's where we have our book heaven category and our little free library category. Little free library books go out into the community. Cleveland has a really robust little free library network. Um, and so we'll put books that are in medium to fair condition in little free libraries and the book heaven bin, um, those books get recycled. We have a recycling company that comes and actually picks up from us for, um, picks up the recycling books for a cost. But then right now the recycled paper market is such that we actually get paid for the books that we send their way. So it, we usually get about $250 when we send books to recycling. And how often does the recycling truck come to pick up? We have to wait until we have uh, either six or 11 Gaylords. Um, so if we're really short on space, we might call them with a, a truckload of six. If, if we've got the space and we can wait, we'll wait for a full truck of, a lot of, of 11. Since it's more cost effective. Okay. Um, so I would say we're usually calling recycling once every other month at the most. Um, and Colleen, two quick things. If you could just tell us how many books per month or per, per year the Cleveland Book Bank is processing. Sure. Um, we will distribute about 50,000 books per month. Okay. And if you can go back over the categories, because I think this is really important, we're going to drop in the chat a list of categories that we've seen so far. But if everybody else can take a look, if there are other categories that you use, if you can drop those in. Uh, after talking to Colleen, Book Fairies is now uh, thinking about changing one of our categories because we thought it would be a lot easier for the people sorting and for the people receiving. Um, but if you wanna start with the board books and baby books. Sure. Um, Kelly, Kelly, while she's doing that, if you could just drop. Oh. You are already on it. Okay. All right. So board books, um, easy to explain to all of our volunteers. Board books are cardboard books for babies. They're made entirely out of cardboard, all cardboard all the time. Um, picture books. These are read aloud stories. We say these are the books that grown-ups read out loud to kids. Um, so these are books like Miss Nelson, a classic. Um, Berenstein Bears, Little Golden Books, Where the Wild Things Are. Um, as long as it's meant to be read out loud or can be read out loud, we consider it a picture book. Early readers, this is a category that tends to be uh, a little bit tough to sort, as I'm sure I've heard from other book banks, a similar um, difficult sorting category. The way that we um, define an early reader is that it has to be leveled and labeled. So the only books we want in this bin are ones that say that they are for a beginning reader. And we also usually identify that they're almost always the exact same size and shape. So we point that out as well. If the book looks like it's a little bit bigger, it's probably a picture book. Early readers typically get sorted uh, at least twice. <laughs> okay. Picture or short chapter is next. Uh, short chapter books are elementary level chapter books for juvenile readers. Um, we, for the most part, try to keep specific grade levels out of the equation and really focus on the inside of the book and what the, what the font looks like, what the letters look like, um, and whether or not there are pictures. So for short chapter, we really want there to be illustrations in the, short, in the chapter books. Um, some examples are like Junie B. Jones, Stink, Magic Tree House. We would also put Diary of a Wimpy Kid in here as well. Um, so these are books that are really geared towards that earlier elementary school chapter book reader, whereas hard chapter, um, we're falling off our canvas bin here a little bit. Hard chapter books are more advanced chapter books for middle schoolers. These are your Harry Potters, your Percy Jacksons, your Artemis Fowls. Um, we usually tell volunteers these don't have illustrations in them and they are geared for a slightly older middle school reader. Lastly is teen young adult. These are more mature books for high school featuring significantly more mature content. We're thinking ages 15 to 18. Uh, we also include books that you might have to read in a high school English class as well as The Hunger Games and Twilight and some of the older um, Harry Potter's 
can see a goblet of fire in there. Um, so those are our main categories. We do get adult books. Um, our organization does not ask for them. Um, and we have not yet found a really great way to make money selling them. Um, so we, we find homes for them with the county jail. We have our paperbacks go there. Um, we also put some of them in little free libraries. And other ones, if they look like they're really nice and in good condition, we might wrap up in brown paper and um, sell them for like little fundraising events. We call them blind dates with a book. We charge about five to $10 for um, a mystery date with, with an adult book that's been wrapped in paper. So one of the other things I know some of us on here are selling books by, by ourselves or our own organization. Um, Book Fairies uses a third party. So what we have done is found people that are selling on Amazon, selling on eBooks, and we have organizations that will come or businesses that will purchase adult books from us. And that's one of the ways that we're able to kind of monetize those adult books as well. Um, once yeah. those books come in, Colleen, can you just go over our, do you check the books for age and condition before they get sorted into those categories? Yes, volunteers are doing that. Um, so when Devin, who's our volunteer, oh, Devin, um, she's waving. Uh, when Devin trains our volunteers, she spends a lot of time talking about the types of books that you're going to be um, pulling out um, and goes through a few different um, categories of books that are, you know, book heaven worthy, for example, something like this, where you've got, you know, crunched beyond repair, it's really, really ripped and torn. Um, books like that, books that are really yellow, um, very smelly, if it smells like grandma's basement is usually what we say. Um, you know, if it's missing a key component, it's supposed to make a noise, but it doesn't. So we verbally go through and explain all of the things that might make a book, um, book heaven worthy. And we have a three-step check process for all of our books that end up going out to our partner organizations. So the first step is sorting, but we actually have two different stations after sorting for different pairs of eyes to look at the book and make another decision about whether they think it's in the right category or not. Um, so hopefully by the time our boxes are getting packed, um, they, are verified and they're as you know they're in good condition and what type of training do you give to the volunteers when they first come in we give a verbal overview and training Devin has examples that she holds up and shows to groups who are here for the first time um, we give everybody a background of our organization as well and make sure that they know how grateful we are that they're here um, and then we really focus on the all of the different reading level categories. So um, a more in-depth version of what I just did, going down the line, taking out examples, talking about the different reading level categories and what they are and sort of explaining uh, what we mean by that. And what I'm going to do is just drop into the chat, the Cleveland Kids Book Bank training manual, which I think was really excellent. So Anybody who sends that out in advance or to any of their volunteers or has it posted on their website, if anybody else has training links on their website, if you want to drop those chats in also, that's going to be really helpful for everybody to see um, how we train volunteers. I think one of the hardest problems that we have is the quality control check and making sure that even those volunteers that have come through a number of times and well, we're very grateful for what they're doing, making sure that everybody is still putting out that same quality. Uh, how do you handle, is there a final check or what do you do when people are kind of stuck and have questions? So a lot of what, what Devin and our staff's job is to do is to be during a two hour shift, really be on your feet, moving around and peeking in and making sure that things look like they're on the right track. Um, what we've noticed, as I'm sure other people have, is like it really just takes like one person who might be a little bit off to, to get the whole bin a little bit off track because everyone's looking at what was in that bin. And, and you know, so keeping on top of um, 
keeping on top of volunteer sorting and just making sure that you're addressing any discrepancies or errors in sorting um, kind of as they come up is, is sort of what we do. And then when we do have packing, which is the third and final step, we really try to make sure if it's possible um, that we have folks who've been here before who've, who've, who are more of our like regulars, more of our experts um, be responsible for the packing job. But if it's not possible, then Devin will really just spend more time um, zeroing in on that one particular reading level that they're packing and making sure that everybody's flipping through the book um, at each step along the way, making sure that it's in good condition. Um, and Colleen, can you just flip your camera back around so that way we can see your operation and take us through that second station of the stickering? Sure. So um, step two is stickering. Um, I have a roll of stickers here just to show kind of what they look like. Oh, wait, there's my camera. There it is. Um, so our stickers have our logo on them. It says happy reading. Um, and when it comes time to sticker, um, volunteers will grab a book, look at the book, decide whether or not it's in good enough condition, um, and then put a sticker in the lower left-hand corner right there. Um, once the book has been stickered, a different group of volunteers will pack that book into a box like this, which we do purchase. Um, the box has a label on it. So if you're packing board books, you'll write the number of books that go in that box. We standardize the number of books in each reading level category. Um, and then the books get packed up in the box like this and we move them over into our inventory. And so, so what, I, what I thought was really interesting is that your books actually get checked several times. So the first time before they even go into a category, somebody is flipping through that book and then putting it into the category. Then yeah. that bin gets pulled over to the stickering station where somebody will take that same book, flip through it again, double check it, before it goes into the packing category. And then somebody at the packing category is again, double checking that book. So that is how you're, you're able to manage around the quality control because you have so many different checks along the way. Yep, like this group right here is actually just working on double checking the books that were in our little free library bin um, and making sure that we're not sending stuff to Little Free Library that really is in good enough condition to go to a partner. So they're they're doing a, a second check of all the books that got put in the Little Free Library bin. And the Little Free Library. So I know you give directly to kids, but the Little Free Library books you pack up and those are available to anybody who wants to, any teacher who wants them for their classroom library, who anyone yeah. who wants them for a community bookshelf or a little free library, they're accessible yeah. for, for those. So you're pretty specific as to the, the books that you give directly to the kids. Correct. Um, the little free library category is used not only to fill little free libraries, like you said, um, it's also um, like our mixed reading level box. So if you've got, if we've got a partner that's really interested in a variety of different ages for whatever program they're doing, we'll offer them that. It's also the category that we typically don't have inventory problems with. So if we have a partner who is requesting a larger quantity of books that we may not have an inventory, um, we'll ask them if they'd be interested in getting little free library books instead. And at Book Fairies, we, we have an additional category, which is our overseas category. And that's for our global partners. So we work specifically with one organization who's sending books across to Africa. And um, those are books that are old, worn, outdated. They wouldn't qualify for your little free library. They're, they're in lower condition than that, um, but they're still good enough that, they're not, that they would not be recycled. And so about 20% of book fairies, their books are going over to build libraries across Africa. So that's just another way, because I know we all get that percentage of books that you're it's kind of crushing you saying, the Shakespeare, it's, it hasn't changed in all these years, but it's yellow yeah. and it's old. It's, so what do we do with those? It's, it's not worth recycling. Somebody can still right. use it. And 
just to go over real quick, if you want to talk about multiple copies in the couple minutes that we have left and just show us your marketplace. Sure. sure. Um, so when we get a donation, which we have a couple times, these are like windfall donations, right? Like these are like the really exciting ones that we might get from Scholastic or um, we've received books from the Molina Foundation before. Um, we usually get, you know, boxes of all the same title, which is really exciting. They're brand new books, but it's hard for us to um, put them into a regular reading level category. So when we have multiple titles of like at least 250 copies of the same book or more, we put them on our marketplace, which is an online storefront almost. It's a Google form, but it, it functions very similarly to a storefront where our partners can go through and request, you know, by quantities of five, how many books they want of specific titles. It's been really popular. Um, and we keep most of our marketplace books over here in this really, um, you know, chaotic looking system that it, it, it's, it's more organized than it looks like. Um, the boxes are sort of grouped together um, by their titles and volunteers go through and look at individual orders and then go through and pack the, um, pack the number of books that the partners have requested. Um, and when we get new books, uh, we, we can update the marketplace. We'll put new titles on every now and then. A lot of the books here, um, you know, like this American Girl book, for example, has been on the marketplace for quite a while because it's definitely not the most popular, but um, other titles like these really cool Curious Critter books that were uh, written by one of our staff's brother-in-laws, they're beautiful, go really quickly because they're board books and they're, they're cute. Um, so it just depends on the books, but it has been really helpful. Even some of the titles that we have so many of that take a really long time um, to go out do end up, you know, finding homes with people who are excited about them. Um, so the marketplace has been really popular with our partners and it's been really helpful for us to get some titles that have been sitting around for a long time. And what about the the titles that you have anywhere from 20 to 50, 100 copies of? How do you manage those? Um, one of two ways, if they're brand new books, we'll probably put them on our bookshelf, which you can see against the wall back there. Um, that bookshelf, those bookshelves are all brand new books where we have, like you said, probably 50 or fewer copies of the same book. Um, when we do pack our boxes, volunteers go over to those bookshelves, which are labeled by their reading level and grab a few copies from each reading level to make sure we're sprinkling the new books into um, a few new books, at least into each box. And then the, the rest of like, if it's a used book, if we got, you know, a school library or something donated a bunch from their collection and they're used uh, we'll probably just sprinkle them into the Gaylords. They'll get sorted. And then it might take a few cycles for all of those books to actually get into boxes because we tell volunteers not to pack more than three to five of the same book in a box. Excellent. Uh, and then just speaking about boxes, I know you recently changed your box size. Can you yeah. tell us about, about that and why? Sure. Let me walk over because I think we still have some of the old size box. We used to use two different sizes of boxes. We used to use big boxes and slightly smaller boxes. You can see this hard chapter category here. Um, this is what the size of our big box used to be and it was too heavy. I mean, it was just really hard for even some of our staff to lift these boxes regularly. Um, it was really limiting. We definitely didn't want our volunteers lifting a a box that size that was totally full of books. So we switched and now all of our boxes are this size. Um, it's meant that in some categories, we went down from putting 50 books in a box to 30 books in a box. Um, but we have found that they're a lot easier to hold and um, they really don't take up that much more space even though we are putting, because the boxes are slightly smaller, um, they're not taking up too much more floor space. We are not exactly sure yet how often we're going to be ordering. Um, right now it's looking like we're going through about a skid a week of boxes. Um, 
I'm anticipating that we will order boxes once every other month, which would come out for us about $12,000 per year. We order our boxes from a local company. They're called Welch Packaging. Um, they function really similarly to some other um, cardboard container providers where you're, you are creating a custom size box um, and the boxes are about a dollar a box. And one of the things that I thought was really important is you're, it's hard to find people who will pick up and deliver the boxes, particularly when the boxes become so heavy and cumbersome and you end up burning through your, your delivery people. And so that was one of the other reasons to switch those to a smaller mm -hmm. box, just to make it easier to find delivery people. Yeah, we have a truck um, and we've, we've been struggling with the position of the truck driver. Um, so when we have been in and out of having that position filled, um, it's been hard to find folks to step in and do the, do the job because the boxes are, are limiting. You have to be pretty strong to lift that many boxes. Awesome. And I see that that Ori, uh, who's the executive director, is jumping in and answering some questions. Thank you so much, Colleen. We're going to drop your information into the chat so anybody can reach out. Um, she gives a mean tour. So if anybody has any other questions or wants to brainstorm, let's let's start working on that so we can streamline our organizations. Um, I am going to take it over and just talk a little bit about transportation. Um, so Kelly, do you mind just taking me off spotlight for a quick second? My question is to everybody, if you could just raise your hand, who has your own delivery trucks? So we get a feel. Uh, you can raise your hand or you can also do the hand emoji in the corner, whichever works easier, and just hold your hand up so people can scroll through because I think that's important. So many of us are small organizations and we're looking to aspire to become those larger organizations with the trucks. I think it really becomes a game changer when you have those. In the database, you'll see people will put in whether they own trucks so you can reach out to other organizations and ask questions. And I wanted to just follow up with the transportation with a unique way that Book Fairies has been able to deliver about 600,000 books a year. We don't own our own trucks, so we don't pick up or deliver any of our books ourselves. But what we've done is created an incredible partnership with the IDD community. And that um, we have about 13 organizations that we engage with. That's for the intellectual and developmental disabilities community. And within these organizations, they're looking for activities to do on a regular basis, whether it is the day have groups or the pre-vocational groups, they're looking for ways to give back to the community and be engaged. Uh, so within those, we have about 180 opportunities a week for individuals to be engaged. Uh, it's about 20 activities a week. They're in vans of four to five people with a supervisor. And the way that Book Fairies does it is using Salesforce, which you'll see in a little bit as Eileen goes through. And we post our activities on an ongoing basis. The, the groups go on, choose the activity. They handle all of our pickups from I'm going to say this, but from Queens out to uh, out to the Hamptons for our area, we're looking at about a four to five hour span uh, is what we're able to work with. And we also have um, been a little bit flexible in that we have three groups that are pre-sorting the books that they are picking up. So they're doing that beginning step for us. So by the time the books come into our warehouse, they're already broken down into our specific categories that we've requested. We then go through them again, but that's a major step to take off our plate. Pain points, just so you guys are aware of them, um, about 10% of our pickups are not completed each week just due to complications. Um, we have trucks coming and going on a regular basis. So there is a lot of work just to manage between 
the people that are waiting for their pickup to happen, the coordinators, um, the, the vans, and there is a lot of turnover with staff. So there's a constant retraining of the individuals to know when what they're doing when they go pick up from places. We have a lot of people come to us to pick up when they were supposed to have gone out to another town to pick up. Uh, so there is turnover. We have a limited number of boxes that the vans can pick up. So uh, each van can hold about 10 boxes. Some vans are super engaged and grab 15 boxes. That doesn't leave anything for the second group that's coming by. So that's been one of the issues as well. And I'm just going over um, a little bit of geographic limitations just in where we can go. We can't get into the city. But I highly recommend looking at the IDD community. They are the backbone of what we do at Book Fairies. And uh, it, it's been such a beneficial relationship. We have just a couple minutes left. I can't believe I got in all this information in this amount of time. Uh, oh, I did want to go back through. If anybody, one of one of the problems that has happened, particularly if you're looking at picking up from Goodwill or Better World Books or someone wants to do a delivery, has anyone had the difficulty where they just don't have the space to accept a large delivery? And what have you done or what creative ways have you come up with to be able to accept those deliveries? Larry? So uh, we invested in, a, actually we got it donated. It's a pallet stacker. So when we've maxed out on floor space, we will take uh, a Gaylord of Books and we'll pile another Gaylord of Books on top of it. It is safe. It's done in Goodwill. I learned from Goodwill. And that's how we clear up floor space. Uh, a pallet stacker, it's not a forklift, but it, the used one will cost if, about six grand if you can't get it donated. Okay, is there anybody else who has come up with creative ways that they've handled, even if it's just a one-time thing. Uh, you can come off mute. Um, Lisa, I see your hand is up. Oh, uh, there's also, you can use third, I mean, you have to pay for it. You can use third-party warehousing systems that will rack, that will receive and rack you. If you have to get, you get a great donation of 80 pallets and you don't have the space for it, you can hire somebody at a, you can pay a, a warehousing organization to receive those and then they'll rack them. And then you can, it's basically a storage fee. You can take them out piece by piece as you as you have space for them, which I had to do once. It was worth it. Um, Eileen? Uh, can Larry share a picture of what a pallet stacker looks like? If, uh, if he has a picture, I don't know if he has a picture, but. I'll get it in the chat. I'll get a link in yeah. the chat. Yeah, that, that would be great. Thanks, never heard of it. Um, I'll just share that at Bookspring, um, one of our board members was able to secure a bay from another nonprofit, which happens to be Amy, a group that works with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and does other services with it. So we've got a bay in their warehouse. Um, and so that is a wonderful asset for us. And it just comes in on our books as a donation and out every year as a donate uh, or every month as donated space. Um, and it has a dock on the end of it. We still can't take a, a huge truckload with a huge Gaylord, but we can take, we, um, we can't take more than like six or seven Gaylords at a time, but it definitely was a game changer for us. Just to, so think you can maybe have a piece of a warehouse instead of a whole warehouse. Yes, that's a, a really good point. I know that we've done that as well. We have borrowed warehouse space when we have a little bit too much room and that has been extremely helpful for us. Um, I am going to end this session because we are going to be jumping into the very next session. Um, Rachel Stein is going to be moderating that and effective book distribution programs, but definitely continue to use the chat to connect with one another.